Hello everyone, this is Kat. Welcome back to My Hero Academia Podfix. This will be the continuation of UA Survival Guide. This will be Part 34, Chapter 34. Returning home from Mizuku's birthday evening out is busy, for lack of a better word. They narrowly miss curfew, arriving exactly three minutes before the boys are supposed to be tucked away safe and sound in their dorms. It doesn't really matter much, Shota could technically wave off Azuku being late, and he's sure they could have done some sweet talking to Namuri, who is the 1C teacher living above the dorms, and bargain Tatoshi's punishment away. Not that Namuri doesn't already owe Shota a handful of favors for all the times that he'd been roped into something stupid at her insistence, and is always promised that, I'll owe you one, Shota, come on. He doesn't cash in very often. And it really doesn't matter in the end anyways, considering they were both being escorted by teachers. They'd walk Tatoshi to his dorm room and bid him a good night, and then the three of them had returned to the 1A dorms. Most of 1A was in the kitchen, and showed a good smell cupcakes baking, no doubt for Izuku, who seems to have come to the same realization. Head ducking as he scuffs his foot in embarrassment, and the teen shakes his head before kneeling down to untie and take off his shoes. When the teen stands back to his full height, he hesitates for a second, glancing around before launching at where Shota and Hisashi are towing off their own shoes, catching them both in a half-hug. "'Thank you,' the boy had whispered, lingering just long enough for Shota to ruffle his fingers through his hair. And Hisashi's hand lifts to rub the back of his shirt and return the hug as well. Izuku presses into the embrace before tearing himself back and taking a couple little steps backward until he's almost in the threshold of the common area. He hesitates a second time, managing a little wave in their direction, before he's turning on his heels and he moves toward the kitchen, where Shota hears his class greeting Izuku happily. Some asking about where he'd been, Izuku stutters out an excuse of an extra quirk training session, while others confess to the birthday cupcakes with enthusiasm. He listens to the conversations for just a second, the cheerful invitations for Izuku to help decorate the cupcakes so they can all have one or two before bed, and their foster child readily agreeing, a warmth in his voice that has brightness settling in Shota's chest. Shota shakes his head as he follows Hisashi over to the elevator. When they finally get upstairs to the apartment, the cats are weaving underfoot. Fish lets out a high-pitched meow as Blanket rushes over to the door in an attempt to escape. Hisashi shuts it just in time and receives an annoyed flick of the cat's tail for his troubles. Nemo circles around Shota's legs before standing on her hind legs and stretching up Shota's leg completely, small little paws batting at his knee. He caves and picks her up. Naughty cat, Hisashi scolds Blanket, wagging a finger at the cat that just ducks down and into a stalking position and chirps at. The last thing we need is you terrorizing the entire building. The door doesn't even lead to the outside anymore, Blanket. It's just more building. Shota snorts a laugh into Nemo's fur, ignoring the swish of her tail as he does so. He's a cat, Hisashi. He doesn't understand you. Well... Hisashi clicks his tongue, bending to scoop up the cat, booming him on the nose. He should understand. He's an indoor cat. He's been told enough times. It's very dangerous out there, Blanket. You're an indoor cat for a reason, you little troublemaker. Scolding him will not make him understand any human language any more than he's capable of. Shota huffs. Leave him be. He's just adventurous. As Satan should be. Hisashi teases, very dryly and ruffling the cat's ears and the fur on the top of his head before letting the cat slink out of his arms. We should have known that he'd be trouble from the start. No cat sweet enough to get a cutesy name like Blanket when their kitten will ever turn into anything but a menace to society. Shota snorts another laugh at that. As he pets Nemo's head, Fish doesn't tend to like being picked up anymore. It's hard on his body. Still, the aged cat does sit by the doorway watching meowing whenever he sees fit to remind everyone of his presence. He's still cute. Sure, Izashi scoffs, but he's the devil behind that cute little face. Never trust the cute ones, show they're always trouble. All three of these little cuties are little demons, too. The devil in cat form, our precious spoiled brat, and the nipping cheese monster. Nemo squirms in his arms, so Shota sets her on the floor, stroking her head once before she saunters away all from them. He watches her turn around the corner before glancing back at Izashi. I'm going to go make a cup of coffee and get some marking done before my current patrol. Did you want a cup of tea or anything? Izashi groans, lifting a hand to card through his hair. Yeah, he pouts. I guess I should get started on marking those essays. Toshi's class is getting antsy to get them back. Look at you being the good influence for once. For once, 
Shota wrinkles his nose. I seem to recall one of us keeping the entire group out of trouble, and it certainly wasn't you or Oboro, and we all ended up in detention whenever Namuri was involved. Hey, Tensei was usually a good boy, but fine, Hizashi relents with a teasing smile. The good teacher influence, then. We both know that you hate marking with your entire existence. I still think the only reason that you were talked into getting your teaching license was because you knew I'd help you mark. Guilty. Shota snorts, it's no secret. Who in their right mind would want to mark twenty-plus essays? Twenty-plus, and not to mention upwards of three classes. That's at least sixty essays, Hizashi. Have you seen some of their handwriting? The lack of grammar? It's a step up from torture. Don't be dramatic. Hizashi laughs. At least you only really have the heroic students to worry about. I have business, gen ed, support, and heroics. A core subject teacher never rests. I have no sympathy for you, Mr. Only teaches heroics. Now who's dramatic? Shota snaps, but his tone holds no heat. Will you grab the assignments on the dresser when you go into the bedroom for your bag? Only since you asked so nicely, Hizashi flashes a grin as he turns toward their bedroom. And because you're making me tea, matcha please, you always make it better than I do. Yeah, yeah. Shota rolls his eyes, but he does head into the kitchen, fish and blanket trailing after him. He has no idea where Nemo disappeared to, but she's still settling with the move and the new furniture as well. Before long, the two of them are settled at the table, with piles of assignments spread between them, Shoda's making a modern-day discrimination essay, getting marks on it, and 1A had had to research for it. All they really had to do was read the textbook of Greek work era and compare it to current discrimination articles that he'd linked them to. Discrimination isn't new, it's an age-old problem, but it has altered along with the quirks that are shaping the world as they know it. Quirks and usefulness in a world of heroics and heroes and villains where... The line tended to be drawn now. It was a disgusting sentiment, honestly, hence why Shota was teaching his kids about discrimination, attempting to teach what he knows has been instilled by parents, guardians, school, the news, and society itself out of the next generation of heroes. It's a headache already, and he's only three essays in. Clearly, they need to spend more time looking at discrimination, quirkless and quirked. Not a single student thus far had even thought to delve into quirkless discrimination, which is quite possibly the more pressing discrimination of the two. A quirk deemed bad is terrible, but not having something that the entire world is built on, relies on, is damn near dangerous. He'll be taking marks off for missing points, though, since the article had a good couple of paragraphs on quirkless discrimination that they disregarded entirely. He wonders what Iziku will have to say. He's always handed in quality essays when he actually put the time and effort in, and... There was definitely some experience with discrimination considering he'd gotten his quirk so late. Shota hopes that the kid's essay doesn't make him want to murder people, but he's sure it will. That seems to be a theme when it comes to whenever Izuku reveals any of his trauma. In as small of snippets as he has been, little mentions that settle acidic-like in Shota's stomach. Society has well and truly fucked up when it comes to that kid. He knows the kid's been wronged, and it's heartbreaking. The part of Shota that doesn't even know the half of it. He's yet to even see the tip of the iceberg, let alone what lays below sight. Shota loathes to think about what school would have been like for Izuku before manifesting a quirk. Children are cruel, preteens and teenagers by far are the worst, though kids themselves are brutally honest and hurtful. Middle school would have been absolute hell for someone without a quirk in a society that runs on quirk usefulness. Not only that, but Shota doubts the kid had many positive adult figures in his life either. Skittishness of teachers and adults in general was always a red flag. He'd noticed how the kid would tuck into himself and look at Shota like he'd laugh or ridicule him at any given moment. Whenever the raven-haired had glanced over or happened to share a half-second of eye contact, any sort of kindness, or even just not straight malice, perhaps, from him was rewarded with caution and suspicion until he'd managed to gain Izuku's trust. Back when the boy had come to him asking for help, when he'd been deemed safe and the child had finally informed him after he'd sent the first few days of classes, watching and waiting. Studying and trying to figure out how a student like Midoriya could have a quirk like that, an attitude like he did, and still not have an ounce of control. What had he said back then? A friend had insisted that Shota would help? Shota bites his bottom lip, shaking his head. Honestly, Shota's lucky that the hero worship Izuku had had outshined his hesitance and cautiousness. He's not sure that they'd be here now if Izuku hadn't ever sought him out and asked for help. Shota can only imagine at some point, uninformed of the situation, that he would have canned Izuku for his lack of control. 
under the suspicion that he was a stuck-up, powerful, quirked brat who didn't care to learn control, expecting to float through class on sheer strength alone. It's not the first time that Shota's expelled a kid like that, and he knows it won't be the last. Plus, a quirk coming in that late. Fifteen is insanely late, even for late bloomers, considering the umbrella term generally covers quirk manifestation before the age of ten. Shota's not sure he's ever heard of a quirk coming in past twelve, and even those are the one in every million at least. Maybe they should get the kid in for some testing. He honestly doubts that Midori Inko had ever looked into anything, especially if Aldera didn't mention anything either, and Recovery Girl, as good as she is, isn't specialized in quirk development. Still, he knows what most teachers do, how powerful quirks are prioritized, and the holder just as much so. A prime example had been Bakako, a poor attitude, but a quirk that was suited for heroics. Shota doubted, honestly, that the kid had ever been reprimanded by a teacher a day in his life from the way that he'd sneered in Shota's direction that first day. He knows enough to know that Izuku and Bakugo's rocky relationships shaped through school, and he'd seen Bakugo think with anger instead of his head on several occasions, and he'd easily used his quirk on Izuku in those first few days of school, so he's doubtful it hadn't been a new development for the new school year. It was learned, something he'd been doing for who knows how long, and it was obvious that he was used to getting away with it. The surprise in Bakugo's gaze had been almost as glaring as the actual glare. Shota had a sick feeling that Aldera Junior High teachers didn't care about the quirkless child being used as a punching bag because he lacked a quirk. Shota doubts it's just the lack of a quirk, too. Shota would bet that Izuku's mumbling and lack of attention isn't new either, but there's no record anywhere of testing being done, or it even being brought up in any of his records. There were reprimands, though, comments of him distracting his peers, not listening, talking through class, unfocused, distracted, all those comments, and yet his grades were so high. He'll admit Izuku's habits are a bit odd. He'd thought as much the first time the kid's eyes had tracked something that wasn't there, or when he'd seemingly be having one-sided conversations. Izuku was always looking somewhere else, eyes drifting subconsciously before whipping back to their target. He'd lose focus but force himself back. It was odd, sure, but it wasn't really that weird, at least not to Shota. The thing was, teenagers, and kids in general, really, he'd come to realize were quirky. They were strange and weird, and if he didn't see it as harmful, he tended to let it be. You can't punish a kid for being who they are, which Shota has a sneaking suspicion is exactly what happened at Aldera, according to his records. It was never enough to be a cause for concern, though, not in his class, and not like how the middle school teachers had reported it. Shota didn't care what Izuku did as long as his grades didn't suffer and that he wasn't distracting his classmates, and he didn't. More often than not, the boy was whispering under his breath. He'd look around and focus on other things that Shota was never able to spot, but he got his work done, and the only one who ever really complained about the mumbling was Bakugo, but since they'd rekindled whatever concerning friendship they share, even that hasn't been happening. There's really nothing to be concerned about. People talk to themselves all the time, right? Izuku's probably been doing it since he was little, as far as Shota can see, it's normal, but it's also not. There's something off about it, something weird, something he just can't place his finger on. There's definitely an unknown to the equation, and Shota hasn't gotten the faintest idea of what it could be. Shota's thoughts loop back to the cat eraser from that evening. Had either of them mentioned it, it was a cat one? Shota doesn't think he had, and he doesn't remember Hisashi saying it either. It was a vague detail that didn't really matter. It didn't add anything to the story. So, how? How had the problem child known? That was such a specific detail, a little one. Who would just randomly know something like that? There had only been three people there. In the classroom that day, Oboro, Hisashi, and himself, there was only three people who knew just what had started the whole thing. It didn't make sense. Hey, what's got you all pouty? Hisashi asks. Shota lifts his attention, eyebrows creasing. He hadn't known his expression had shifted. His Ashi isn't looking at him, eyes reading over the assignment on the table in front of him. Shota has half a mind to believe that he imagined his husband's words until his Ashi is looking up with a cocked eyebrow. What's up? I was just thinking. Shota reveals easily, setting his pen down and carting his fingers through his own hair. He gives a sigh. Did you think Izuku was, I don't know, acting a little off today? Off? Hisashi hums, setting his own pen down and arcing his back in a stretch before slumping back against the backrest. Off how? I don't know if Izuku has a normal here, Shota. You need to be a little bit more specific. I was thinking about what he said, about the eraser, at the arcade. The eraser? Hisashi blinks before understanding lights up in his features. Oh, the cat eraser. 
Yeah. Shota drags a hand down his face. How did he know? That's not something you just know, you know? I I mean, sure, he could have guessed. It isn't that much of a leap that I like cats. Anyone who knows me knows I wouldn't give two shits about any old eraser, but still, I don't know, it just, it was odd. Yeah? Hisashi nods, thumbing at his lip thoughtfully. I was thinking about that, too. He's definitely... I mean, he could have guessed. The listener's pretty smart, but he just knew. He knew, but in a way that he didn't know, you dig? It was a question still. Shota gives an agreeing hum. I've noticed it before, but not like today. He's never done anything like that. He shouldn't have known such a small detail, but he did. I'm just... confused. Hmm. Izashi hums out, head lolling back so that he's staring up at the ceiling. Could be a quirk. His mother has some sort of telekinesis quirk, doesn't she? We don't know his father's quirk, but maybe there's some sort of underlay, a mental-based ability that's been passed down or something? Izuku already has a quirk, Shota reminds. You know, superpower, the quirk that's broken over 80% of his body since he manifested it? Uh-huh. Hisashi's lip twitches into a smile. Says the man whose quirk is a scarily powerful erasure, but also has a hint of your mother's own secondary telekinesis quirk that was passed down by your grandmother that's combined into that erasure quirk. You know, the one that makes your hair stand up on end when you activate your quirk. You know better than anyone that quirks aren't linear, and they can combine and get stronger. I know. Shoto narrows his eyes. I just think it's weird. It's... It was just the three of us who were there that day. I didn't tell him. I assume you didn't tell him, and Obero couldn't have. It's illogical. I don't understand. I didn't tell him, Izashi confirms. Honestly, I barely remember that day at all. I wasn't even the one who fell from the ceiling and my life still flashed before my eyes. I couldn't think of anything, least of all your kitty eraser, as I watched him plummet. He was fine, showed a huff softly, that distant feeling of fond guilt tugging at his chest. He got up just fine, and he played that stupid arcade game too, just fine. Yeah, but he still had that gnarly bruise, though. I mean, yeesh. His ass was completely black. I don't know how he didn't break something. I mean, his tailbone at least, you dig? What? Shota draws with an upward tick of his lips. You spend a lot of time looking at our friends' asses in school, or just Obero in particular. Nah, are you jealous I was looking at other men, sweetheart? It's not like we were a thing back then. Hisashi snorts, his socked foot hooking around Shota's ankle under the table. I thought you still sort of hated me around then anyways, and we both know that Obra wasn't shy in the least. How a teenage boy could just drop his pants so easily, I'll never understand. Hey, though, don't you worry, darling, I spent way more time checking you out. I'm honored, Shota teases dryly. The underground hero sobers, glancing down at his papers. I still just don't feel great about it, Zashi. I mean, how did he know? Even if it was a residual quirk effect, what sort was it? Should we be worried about it? About him? Does it have anything to do with the mumbling, the staring off into space? Should we be helping him train it? Does he even know that it's there? Hey, hey, Hisashi frowns. Calm down a little. Hisashi's hand snakes across the table and settles lightly over where Shota's own is pressed flat over the essays. He appreciates how Hisashi's fingers curl into the gap between his fingers and thumb, letting the fingers wedge under his hand and grip in a grounding squeeze. He's okay, Shota. Izashi's voice takes a calming tone. This isn't a new problem, even if it's just now being really drawn out to our attention. He's been dealing with the mumbling habit and attention difficulties just fine for years before we even met him. I don't know how he knew about the Eraser show, I really don't. But I also don't think asking and cornering him is the way to go. He's warming up to us, he's settling in. He's a teenager who's been dealing with this for far longer than we've even known him. We can't press, and I know you want to do that. But you know that. Prying will only make it worse. Prying will make him feel cornered. We'll have to let him come to us, or discuss it as a family if it becomes a problem and we see a legitimate reason or a need to bring it up. I think it'll embarrass him, Sho. He's just not there yet. Izashi pauses, thumb dragging over Shota's knuckles lightly. If we don't have to pry, I don't think that we should just yet. We're in a sensitive position, Shota. I don't want to break that trust that we're building. I agree it should be addressed, but maybe not just yet. I suppose it doesn't affect his school. Shota slumps in his chair. And none of the other teachers have really said anything. Hound Dog hasn't even mentioned anything. He's gotten a little bit better at keeping focus during class, and I don't catch him mumbling quite as much. I I just don't like leaving something like this to fester. 
I know, Izashi lets out a quiet laugh. But it doesn't seem like it bothers him, and you remember how skittish he was when you asked Recovery Girl about it. He could hardly look us in the eyes. If it becomes a problem, we'll talk to him about seeing someone and getting a possible diagnosis, but if he doesn't see it as a problem, then we should respect that. Until it affects him, Shota presses his lips into a straight line. Bingo, babe. Hisashi shoots a half-hearted set of finger guns. He's a mature little kiddo. We just gotta give him some benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Shota rubs at his eyes. Okay. Besides, we don't even know for certain it's a residual quirk, Hisashi continues with a soft smile. He really could just have some form of ADHD or something. There's no definitive answer here, and there are logical explanations to what he does. I know how you and logic go hand in hand, and... Honestly, we aren't even sure that one of us didn't accidentally give the detail away during the story. We both know that he's scarily perceptive. Maybe we should set him up to see a quirk specialist. A professional. Shoda relents. Or at least talk to Recovery Girl about those additional tests that she mentioned. After we run it by him, at least, I think it would be helpful. If he agrees, Hizashi shrugs, it doesn't directly affect his health, so we can't really force him, you dig? I dig. Shota sighs and ignores the way that his husband visibly brightens. That's always his favorite response. Shota very rarely humors him. They settle back into their markings, letting silence fall over them. Shota just can't seem to focus on the papers, though. It feels like they should be doing more for Izuku. Hisashi's right. It hasn't technically affected his life, but at the same time, if they can help it, why aren't they? Shota likes to think he knows his kids better, his 1A brats, but he also knows Hisashi knows teenagers in general better. Outside of school, he's the one who does the most socializing. Whenever Put Your Hands Up Radio hosts anything, the teens are always the one who flock, and if only just to chat and meet present Mike. He relents and tries to force the thoughts down. He'll just keep a closer eye on the kids, and he'll do some research so he's ready if he does need to take things into his own hands. As is, he's already certain of some of his other kids, maybe having some developmental issues. Kaminari, who Shota is near certain, has dyslexia. Shota waves away the train of thought. He glances down at the papers and picks up his pen. Just, he still is distracted. Hey. Shota breaks the silence. His Ashi glances up, one eyebrow arching in a silent question. Why did you stop me? His Ashi cocks his head in confusion, so Shota elaborates softly. At the arcade, when I was going to ask him about the eraser. Oh. His Ashi breathes out before shrugging sheepishly. I didn't want him to freeze up, you know. He was already a bit on edge about his birthday, and I just had a bad feeling that any sort of interrogation, as innocent as it would have been, would have just spooked him. I mean, he was smiling, show. He was happy. The entire time he was been with us, I haven't ever seen him acting so much like, I don't know, a regular kid, I guess. I just wanted to keep it that way, and after everything recently, I just thought he deserved to get to relax. Mineta gets expelled within the first two weeks of dorm life, right before the provisional licensing exam. It's been a long time coming, and with how he acts around the girls, he's been gross since the first day, but this had been a whole new level that just couldn't be brushed off by the girls or the guys. Izuku can't find it in himself to be sympathetic for the guy. He'd made crude comments all year since the literal first day of class, but it's hard to come back from somehow managing to drill a peeping hole in the wall that had a full view of the girls' as communal showers. It's disgusting. Izuku feels sick at the thought. It's Sarah who finds the pervert foaming at the mouth as Hagekuri and Ashido step in to shower after their jog. Izuku himself hears the shouting from his dorm room, and he, like the rest of the class, all rush toward the heart of it. Least to say the girls are rightfully upset when everyone gathers, Ashido and Hagekuri, and nothing but towels that they clutch tightly, while Yayorozu and Uraka comfort them. They're all genuinely disgusted and appalled at the small Mineta height eye hole in the wall. What a repulsive breach of privacy. He's supposed to be a hero. Mineta clearly only thinks with one part of his body, and certainly isn't his brain. The teen in question is further down the hall, wrapped tightly in a cocoon of Saro's tape and stuck to the wall near the ceiling, so even if he could escape, it's a long drop. When the girls have all calmed down enough so no one's shaking, either with fear or anger, the six of them all head to the communal shower so Hakikuri and Ashido can shower in peace. Saro puts a piece of tape over the hole on the outside, but Izuku can tell that one of the girls is still covering on the other side, just by how the patched hole darkens. Good. They leave Mineta in the hall and gather in the common area, a general blanket of unease, anger, and disgust covering the room. 
Uzuku subtly yet urgently invites Shota to join them via text, and he gets a fast response of, On my way. Shota arrives just as the girls do, the man taking just one second to survey over everyone before his nose wrinkles and his eyes harden into something dangerous. Where's Mineta? Shota makes quick work of getting Mineta out of the dorms, not even bothering to unwrap him from the tape, and he instead just adds a layer of capture weapon that he uses to drag the teen out. Everyone stay here, Shota demands softly, scanning over all the teens before turning back toward the door. I'll be right back. He returns promptly and lets the group explain what exactly went down. Saro explains what he saw, nose wrinkling in a sneer, and Hage, Kure, and Ashido tell him what they noticed, spotting the peephole only because of the commotion on the other side of the wall. Yaoyorozu is the one who shows Shota the hole in the wall. The man narrows his eyes as he crouches enough to study the hole, even pulling the tape enough to determine that it sees directly into the shower cubicles. A grim look settles over his face as he stands to his full height, he replaces the tape, and Izuku knows that the sight of the hole offends the man. It offends him as well. He has done stuff like this before, Ida explains tightly, but they're all back down in the common area. But never like this. We should have told you sooner, Sensei. The comments were unsavory, but we'd never let him do anything further if we'd have known his intentions. I always thought he was kidding around, Kaminari breathes out, looking apologetically at the girls all squished together and round the love seat. I'm sorry he wasn't. I, I know this was sort of... I was sort of his friend, but I'd never do anything like this. I respect you guys. I mean, girls, it's just... it's gross what he did. It's fine, Kaminari, Jiro quips with a small upward tick of her lips. Don't short-circuit on us. You didn't do anything Mineta did. I talked with him, though, Kaminari cries out. I thought that he was just admiring you guys, too. You're all pretty, so I thought... but I, I didn't think that he'd... We knew that you were just crushing, Ashido smiles teasingly. It was cute, Denki-kun. We never thought that you were like Mineta at all. Don't worry. The girls all mumble agreements, and Kaminari's cheeks light up in a blush at the attention. Shota calls back everyone's attention to him, looking unamused at the teenage teasing. Izuku almost laughs. Were there any other incidents that I should know about? Shota asks from where he stood before them all, able to scan the class easily. Anything at all. Any time that he's done something that made anyone uncomfortable. Well, Izuku bites the inside of his cheek. Th there was the hot springs incident. I meant to bring that up to you, but, well... Izuku doesn't want to remind anyone of the camp. It's too soon, considering not even a month has passed. What happened? Shota asks calmly, though his eyes are dark with anger. He scoured a wall, Kirishima explains grimly so he could see the girls naked on the other side. We tried to talk to him out of it, but he just wouldn't listen, just leapt, using his quirk to climb over, and then he was halfway up the wall. He didn't even see anything, though. Kotakun was the one who stopped him, Izuku offers up with a sheepish smile. But then he lost his balance, I think, and fell. I brought him to Mandalay after that. So this isn't his first offense, Shota summarizes tensely. The man blows out a slow breath as he straightens up. He offers a quick bow to the class. Thank you for the information. I'll keep everything that you brought to my attention in mind when we determine his punishment. Rest assured, he will no longer cause any of you any harm, and I apologize for letting this carry on as long as I have. It really isn't your fault, Sensei, Ida frowns. We all should have done better to ensure that our classmates were safe. We never took him seriously, but we should have, and that's our fault. No. Shota shakes his head, and he stands back to his full height. I am the adult, and I'm also your teacher, and your current guardian. The fault is my own for not keeping a closer eye on the situation, and I don't want any of you taking any blame. You're all my responsibility, Mineta included. But Sensei, Ashido pouts, launching up from her spot and trapping Shota in a hug. He never did anything when you were around, so you couldn't have known if none of us said anything, so you can't take the blame. He's just a sneaky little pervert. I don't blame you, Sensei. The girls once again all mumble agreements, as Hagekure joins Ashido in hugging the man. Izuku can't help but think that they're all seeking silent assurance from the man, and he seems to come to the same conclusion as he easily offers it by wrapping a slight arm around each of them. He still looks faintly uncomfortable, but he's trying at least. Shota shoots Izuku a light glare when the green-haired teen grins almost teasingly at him. When the two girls finally tug away from the man, Shota offers up the idea of a movie day while he sorts out the situation. 
Everyone's quick to jump on the idea, offering up their own favorite movies, up for the class to decide upon, while Kachan and Kirishima disappear into the kitchen to make popcorn. Shota is gone for a couple hours, and when he returns, he's joined by a troubled-looking detective, Sukuchi. The detective manages a light smile as everyone looks toward him in confusion, and Shota gestures to Sato, who has the remote deposit. Mineta will no longer be a student at the school, Shota announces after Sato pauses the film. He's been expelled. An investigation has been opened against him. That said, this is not something you need to concern yourselves with. This is a matter for me, as your teacher, and the police to handle. Shota looks around, gauging the students' emotions through their expressions. I would like to warn you all right now that within the next half an hour, we'll be escorting Mineta to collect his belongings. Following this, he will no longer have access to the campus, so none of you will have to deal with him again. If you feel unsafe, or you don't want to see him, please stay with your friends and put yourself somewhere that you feel will be comfortable and safe, whether that's your dorm room or friends. I'll be waving away your curfew tonight, so you're welcome to stay with your friends if you'd like. I trust that you all will still respect the rules and remain in your own wings of the building. The detective nods. Eraser told me about all of the incidents you all shared with him, and I'll be looking into everything. With what I know so far, I have enough to open an investigation on your ex-classmate. There is a possibility, though, that I may need some statements from you. I can go off of Eraserhead's word for now, but statements would help a lot as well. We'll follow procedure, since you're all minors, and you'll have the option of having either Eraser or one of your guardians sit with you. You're all also welcome to meet with me, or come to me any time that you need to share, and I'll pass that on to the detective. Shota offers softly. If anything comes to mind that you wish to report, please don't hesitate to come find me. Detective Tsukuchi nods in agreement. When Mineta is brought in, most of the girls and a few of the boys are gone. Yagirosu is the only girl who chose to stay, sitting stiffly beside Ida and almost surrounded by the remaining boys like Mineta is a threat to her, even sandwiched between a pro-hero and a police detective. The remaining students glare as Mineta was escorted through the dorms to collect his belongings. He's escorted off just as fast. Shota keeps between Mineta and the rest of the students the entire time. I should be going. I have to get to the station with Mineta before his guardians arrive. Detective Tsukuchi gives the remaining students a tiny sympathetic smile. What Mineta's done is a serious offense, and it could very well result in fines and possible jail time. I'm glad that we caught this before it escalated into something more. We'll be in touch, Eraser. Shota waves the man off with a tired hand, glancing back into the room. Somehow, when the rest of the students return, they manage to convince their teacher to join them for another movie, and following that, an entire class sleepover. Shota looks exasperated when he's trapped on the couch, surrounded by Ashido, Hagekure, and Uraraka. The seats are taken fast while Asuku is up, grabbing a water bottle from the kitchen, so when he returns to see everything taken, including most of the spaces on the floor in front of the couches, he simply settles at Shota's feet and leans back against him cheekily. He throws his head back against his guardian's knees, grinning upside down at Shota. With an exasperated huff, Shota lets his legs stretch out, resigning himself to his fate of being stuck watching a movie with him. Izuku smiles the entire movie. He's not sure when he falls asleep, but he's lulled into sleep by the soft snores of his classmates, leaning against Shota's knee as gentle fingers tossle through his hair. It's the best sleepover that he's ever been to. The next day, the hole in the wall has been patched. Before Izuka knows it, the provisional licensing exam is upon them. The morning is slow. Shoda had been giving them the warning the evening before, so everyone would be ready for when the bus arrived. That included assuring the students that he would not be making them traverse through the forest to get to the exam, even as he tried to not let that tiny amused smile threaten to curl onto his lips, though. The class is up and ready before the time Shoda even makes his way down, and everyone is just nervously yet excitedly enjoying a breakfast of pancakes that Sato made for them. Izuka thinks he's channeling his nervousness into something useful, and he won't complain as he enjoys the fluffy breakfast as well. When Shota finally comes down, he cocks a surprised eyebrow at the sight of all of them dressed and ready to go, costume cases tucked under their chairs, and all almost finished eating. The bus will arrive in half an hour. Everyone be outside at the bus loading area at 5-2. Got it? There's an enthusiastic cheer of yes, sensei, which pleases Shota enough that he simply nods and disappears out the front doors. Obero is near vibrating at Izuku's side, chatting excitedly about his own licensing exam. Izuku half listens to him, and half listens to the conversations going on around him. He is trying to keep note of what Obero is saying, what to expect, since Shota hadn't really explained much, but he also thinks the exam probably would have changed over the years. It's been 14, maybe 15 years since Obero took it. 
so Izuka's not sure his information is trustworthy. Still, it can't hurt to make note of what the ghost is saying. When the designated time their sensei gave them approaches, everyone crowds in the Genkin, all rushing to push their shoes on and get outside where Shota is undoubtedly waiting. The bus ride is a couple hours long. It's filled with nervous energy. Shota sits in the first seat, only glancing back every so often, and Obero sits beside his school friend, considering Todoroki had taken the seat beside Izuku when they got on the bus. Everyone is still vibrating with nerves as Shota leads them off the bus and they all gather around to collect their costumes. Eraser! Izuku turns to see who called out, entirely too aware of how Shota had bristled at his side. The man heaves a sigh as a woman bounds towards them, the entire class stopping to look. I know that scowl anywhere! I saw you on TV at the sports festival, but it's been a while since we met up. Izuku takes a second to look between the two of them, from Shota's scowl to the woman's Miss Joke, his brain whispers in awe. It's a cheerful smile. The two have a staring contest for just a second. Shota's eyes narrow, while Miss Joke is grinning almost teasingly. Joke. Shota greets gruffly. Izuku watches, head cocked slightly, as the woman settles in front of Shota, closer than not many people would ever dare to get. His guardian's shoulders slump, and he tucks his hands in his pockets, eyes narrowed in a way that Izuku doesn't quite understand. Obero is sniggering beside Izuku, and the teen glances over quickly. Let's get married! Izuku nearly chokes on his own tongue in surprise, attention shooting back to where Shota looks torn between annoyance and exasperation, as the heroine just grins brighter. There's a playful light in her eyes. No. Shota drones, like it's a familiar thing. Ashido makes a cooing noise at Izuku's side, but he can't look away from his guardian and Miss Joke. He doesn't know what's happening. Is she flirting with him? Does she not know that Shota and Hisashi are married? Should Izuku be concerned here? He turns his head faintly to where Obro is watching him, and the ghost lets out a snort of laughter. They're friends, dude. Well, sorta. Well, I guess they're really more of acquaintances, work buddies. Show's known Fukukado since way early into his hero career. Izuku's mouth forms an O-shape, but he doesn't breathe a sound. That makes sense. But still, what kind of relationship do they have? Shota doesn't look too interested, but Miss Joke doesn't seem to be taking a hint. She's smiling widely like it's a game, and maybe it is. Plus, Shota isn't directly telling her to leave, or to leave him alone, so he must be used to it. Despite the rejection, Miss Joke just hunches over and laughs. You're a real riot, buddy. I'm supposed to be the funny one. Shota looks quite unamused, but it's odd considering Miss Joke's quirk is outburst. It makes people laugh, but she just can't seem to get him to even smile. Shota's a tough one to crack. As usual, the man regards tiredly. You're impossible, Joke. Come on, eraser. She teases easily, inching closer to him, smile never waning. Imagine it. If I was your wife, you'd have a future full of constant laughter. I know I dream of it. That sounds like an actual nightmare. Shota quips back, very dryly. Joke bends over once again into a full fit of laughter, and Shota just watches uninterested, unmoving from his slumped form. Izuku's wide eyes flick between them, shifting awkwardly on his feet. As he observes them, the interactions, their words. There's something about watching her openly flirt with his guardian that puts him on edge, and he doesn't even know why. It's innocent, isn't it? It's obviously familiar to Shota, but... But does Hizashi know? Is he aware that... This hero is flirting with Shota when he's not around. You two seem close, Asui observes, and Izuku agrees with the notion. Shota is definitely exasperated, but in the way that he is with the teachers at UA, and Izuku's classmates, not in the way that he is when he encounters someone that he's not particularly fond of. Oh, our agencies were really near each other, Joke offers dramatically. Shota's eyes roll in annoyance as he shakes his head lightly. Izuku thinks that he's probably heard the same shtick a couple of times. How often does Miss Joke actually flirt with him? Has he not told her he's married? Does she not care? As young heroes, striving to make the difference in the world, a mutual love blossomed. No, it didn't. Shota refuses in a huff. Izuku feels his guardian's eyes flick over in the direction of the students. Easily singling on Izuku, the teen blinks, and the man blows out a breath. The woman whips back to Shota before he can add anything else, grinning widely. I do miss your quick retorts. Really? Shota drawls. Can't say I missed your jokes. He's so harsh, Ashido cries out. But I think Sensei likes her. They're so cute. Please, do not speculate about our Sensei. Ida scolds underneath his breath. Probably so Shota doesn't hear. The engine-quirked teen is shooting Izuku a knowing look. Sensei's personal matters aren't a concern of ours. 
You're such a stick in the mud, Ashido pouts, sticking her tongue out. They are cute, Hagekori adds with a laugh. Mina's right. I think we should listen to Ida, Todoroki shrugs. Sensei doesn't look happy. Yeah, Izuku clears his throat. It's a bit weird talking about Sensei like this. You wound me, Miss Joke whines dramatically, placing her hand against her chest like she's trying to protect her heart. The words draw Izuku's attention away from his classmates and back to his teacher and Miss Joke. You're an absolute hoot, Eraser. I just know you love my jokes. Izuku's eyes flick between the two of them as Shota lets his gaze settle back on the other pro. Love and suffer through are two very different things. Joke bursts into another bout of laughter, wiping out a stray tear. Joke straightens up and inches closer to Shota, which is followed by the man gritting his teeth. At least she backs off when she realizes that there's tension that's different to the irritation he'd expressed up until that point. Shota's eyes flick back to the students as if it's a warning, and following that, after a second of confusion, green eyes jump to the crowd of UA students as well. Miss Joke scans over them calculatingly before she catches Izuku's gaze, the two of them keep on contact for a second before Miss Joke is whipping back to Shota, and grinning widely. There's a different sort of humor in her eyes now, more teasing than playful. Not in front of your students, then, Joke coos with far more energy. I would hate to embarrass you in front of your kids. I guess my love for you will just have to wait. We'll have to rendezvous after the exam, then. No, we won't. Will you please stop? The man sighs before turning to the students. Listen up. I want everyone to grab their costume cases and get inside for orientation. Don't be late. Miss Joke's students join in just as Ida and Yayorozu were unpacking and handing out everyone's hero costume cases, so they all talk a little bit as everyone waits for their belongings. They all seem nice enough, but Izuku is still thinking about how Miss Joke was acting around Shota. They're talking still, quietly. Shota still looks just as annoyed as when he'd first gotten stuck in the conversation, while Miss Joke is grinning brightly, nudging Shota playfully every time she glances over in the student's direction. Izuku can't help but thinks it's a little bit strange. Soon all the students are trailing into the building. There's not much order, no matter how hard Ida is trying to corral everyone. The Ketsubutsu students are grabbing their own costumes and join 1A. Everyone is nice, but maybe a little too nice. You nervous? Izuku startles as he looks back at where Obero is leaning against the bus. A bit. Izuku replies under his breath. He looks around to make sure there's no one in the vicinity. His classmates are all filing into the building now, and Shota has gotten gradually more annoyed where Miss Joke was suddenly looking a little bit more serious than Izuku thinks he's ever seen her in the media. Huh. Don't worry about them, Oboro huffs when he catches where Izuku's looking. She's probably just teasing him for being a sadist, in a serious sort of way. What? Izuku blinks. Why? Zuku, buddy, did you, uh, notice how you didn't have to introduce yourself to anyone here? How none of UA kids had to? Your competitors just knew who you were, right? Well, yeah, Izuku blinks in confusion. Didn't even think about it. A lot of people just know who we are. They probably saw us at the sports festival. It was broadcasted on TV and... Izuku cuts himself off with a sharp inhale. Oh, God. They... they know our quirks. They saw us use our quirks, our fighting styles. They know what we can do and we know nothing about them. You catch on fast, Obro laughs lightly, scratching the back of his neck. Yeah. He didn't warn us, Izuku breathes out frantically. They they know everything about us. Oh no, he, he is a sadist. It's a learning opportunity, Obro shrugs lightly. You'll be on the news when you're a hero, your quirk will be known, your face will be known, and your fighting style will be known. Villains are going to have access to all that information, just from news coverage alone, and they'll be ready. It's a good lesson. Izuku decides, shoving down the bead of betrayal. It's a safe environment for us to learn something like this. The other students will go hard on us, but they're not trying to kill us like a villain would. I I understand it, but still, a heads up would have been nice. We're walking into a 1A versus everyone else fight. He's basically sending us into a trap. Yep. Obero snorts a laugh. That's exactly how it's going to play out, too. Happens every year. Shota just likes seeing how far you students have come, and... How you overcome obstacles using your wits and skills, it's totally sadistic. He definitely could have given you a heads up, but it's also a good way to see where you're all at in a controlled environment when he's not the mediator or the judge. I get it, Izuku nods, biting his bottom lip. You know, you're not allowed to even step foot in the exam, right? Under no circumstances, I'm serious this time, we will not be having another sports festival incident. Yeah, the ghost wilt sadly. I assumed... At least Joke's here to be funny, since Shota's a bore who just watches and silently nitpicks. 
I would love to hear his thoughts, just honestly. Izuku wrinkles his nose at the mention of Miss Joke. He's not sure what to feel. There's that hero worship that he has, but then there's the sinking feeling that she was flirting with a married man. Problem child? Izuku startles hard, almost dropping his costume case, and it's just then that he realizes he's facing the bus, talking to nothing. His peers are gone, and most everyone is already in the building, and he's about to get in trouble. Are you all right? The question throws him for a loop, and he's quick to nod as he clutches his costume to his chest. Shota doesn't look convinced, gaze dropping briefly to where Izuku's arm squeezed the case, before lifting back up to his face. He doesn't say anything, which Izuku's very grateful for. I'm sorry about joke. Shota offers. I didn't know she was going to be here with her second years, or I would have given you a heads up about what she's like. Oh, um... Don't apologize. You couldn't have known. Just... Izuku swallows. But was... Um, was she flirting with you? Unfortunately. Shota sighs. He glances back toward the building, wrinkling his nose as he turns back to the team, gesturing him forward. We'll walk and talk. You can't be late for orientation, all right? R right. Izuku yelps, taking a couple steps forward until he falls into step with his guardian. They're quiet for a couple of paces until Izuku manages to organize his thoughts. Are you friends? Yes. Shota doesn't hesitate. I wasn't fond of her at first, but then again I wasn't fond of Hizashi at first either. They're just so loud. You should hear the two of them in a room together. It's just great when Hizashi loses control of his quirk as he laughs because of her quirk. Busted my eardrum. Can confirm. It was loud. Obro tells him, keeping pace at Izuku's other side. The ringing in my ears didn't stop for days, and I'm a ghost. Izuku swallows down his laugh. So, Hizashi knows about Miss Joke, too. Does she... is she, um, like that when he's around, too? She's always like that, kid. Shota snorts a laugh. But yes, Hizashi knows her as well. They talk more regularly than Joke and I do, and... She's made it her personal mission to get me to laugh whenever she sees me. She's tamer with everyone else. Oh, Izuku breathes out, shoulders losing some of the tension. Obro chuckles at Izuku's side. I told you it was nothing. What, were you worried I was cheating on Hizashi? Shota teases knowingly. Izuku keeps quiet, not wanting to offend his guardian. He had been a little worried, even if Shota wasn't reciprocating the advances. Don't worry, problem child. Shota bumps his shoulder against Izuku's lightly. Nothing's going on with Joke. Trust me, it's just a big joke. Obviously on brand for her. She's been doing this since I first met her. Literally proposed like that the first time we met. She didn't even know my hero name the first time that idiot asked me to marry her. Izashi got a kick out of it when I told him. Really? Izuku cocks his head. His guardian gives a hum. And Hizashi is very aware of her odd humor as well. She proposed to me at our wedding, too, after our vows. And then after I said no, she proposed to Hizashi as well. I know what it looked like today, problem child, so I'm proud of you for looking out for Hizashi, but you can rest assured that I have no interest in anyone else, and I'd honestly rather throw myself off a building than marry Joke. Izuku snorts a laugh at the dramatics. That's harsh. That's realistic, Shota huffs. I like her enough as a friend, but I couldn't deal with her constantly. Hizashi's definitely enough brightness for me. Aww. Izuku coos, laughing brightly when his guardian shoves him away with a playful scowl. Don't make me expel you, the man threatens without any heat or intent. Besides, now I have you as well, sunshine child, bright husband, sunny child. Izuku doesn't know how to respond when it suddenly is turned around onto him, so he just tries not to let his entire face light up in a light flush as he looks away from his guardian. The man lets out a soft exhale that sounds suspiciously like a laugh as he ruffles Izuku's hair. Now, go on, join your peers. Orientation will be starting soon. Do your best, all right? I'll be watching from the stands. I'll try my best. Shota hadn't really been expecting to find his foster son and Bakugo physically fighting on the night after the licensing exam. The exam had gone well, with 17 of his students passing and getting their licenses. He'd been proud that so many had passed, especially with everyone targeting them. It truly is almost an unfair exam for UA students, but... The thing about heroics is that being a hero is not going to be fair. It's a lesson better learned early than learned late. His initial worry that he sees the notification on his security feed is that Bakugo is angry that he didn't get his license like Izuku and the majority of the class and that he's taking it out on him. It doesn't make much sense. The two of them had been on relatively good terms since they'd been kidnapped together, but 
It's still a nagging thought in the back of his mind as he loops his capture weapon over his head and rushes out the door. He's already tired from being trapped on a bus with 19 insane children for a couple of hours, and to make matters worse, Hisashi had been asked to aid in a surveillance mission with the police, so he's not even in the apartment that evening. It's really just the icing on top of the cake that Yagi's standing between him and his fighting students, and he can hear the explosions and the crackles of Bakugo's quirk from here, and the fun-sized number one hero is standing in his way, with placating hands like that will calm Shota at all. Shota's only hesitating on rushing to stop the fight when Yagi tells him that they're fighting over All Might's retirement, and not the exam standings. He's confused, rightfully so, but he gives Yagi the benefit of the doubt as he waits like suggested. Yagi knows Izuku and Bakugo well, and as well as Shota himself knows his students, he doesn't understand this, but Yagi clearly does. So as much as he doesn't really want to, he takes a step back, and he lets the number one pro handle it. Until it comes to patching the kids up and doling out the punishments, his teeth are gritted as he perches on the coffee table before the two of them, disinfecting wounds and patching them up. They're in the 1A living room because a scuffle is nothing to go to the infirmary for. The first thing he asked them was if either of them needed medical attention, and they both just guiltily shook their heads, plus Recover Girl would have probably scolded him for waking her up for something like this. They don't get the privilege of her quirk for fighting like two kindergartners throwing fits without supervision. They'll learn from the scrapes and bruises. Since you threw the first punch, Shota points sternly at Bakugo, who's scowling. You get four days of house arrest. The kid grits his teeth and looks away, but he doesn't bother voicing any complaints. And you. Shota turns to Izuku, who's cowering slightly. He pushes down the worry this is his student right now, not his foster son. He'll get the same punishment as the other students, that break curfew and fight without supervision. You get three days for fighting with him. Izuku just nods slowly, not daring to look at Shota. He's probably still glowing with anger. It's always these two, isn't it? Neither boy offers anything else, no excuses or apologies past those first initial ones. They don't try to get a lesser punishment or even weasel out of said punishments. They know that they're in the wrong, and that's really all Shota can hope for, especially when it comes to these two. I'm disappointed in both of you. I don't know what you were thinking, but if you need to blow off some steam, come to me and I can set you up in a training room. If either of you try anything like this again, or I catch you doing anything even remotely close to what you did tonight, you will not be getting a third chance, understood. Y yes sensei Izuku squeaks. Shota tries not to look at the bandages on his face. Got it. Bakugo breathes out through clenched teeth. They're both dismissed. Yagi as well. Bakugo is quick to get up and leave toward the dorm rooms with heavy footfalls, and Yagi takes his leave with an apologetic smile in Shota's direction, as well as a light pat to Izuku's shoulder. Shota boxes up the rest of the first aid supplies that he used, clicking the clamps into place and setting the box on the table. He blows out a breath and regards the last person in the room. Izuku hadn't moved. Anything to add? He asks quietly as he sits at his foster son's side. He throws an arm over the back of the couch, just faintly brushing against Izuku's squared up shoulders. I'm sorry, the boy whispers, pulling at his own fingers nervously. I know. Shota sighs, and he does. He knows they're both sorry for what they did, for fighting like they had over All Might's retirement for whatever reason. He doesn't doubt it's something that they both probably needed, but it doesn't make it right. I can't say it's okay, kid, because it's not. One of you could have been hurt, and I didn't even know either of you left the dorms until I got a notification. I get needing to blow off steam, but fighting a classmate after dorm curfew is not the way to do it. You sound like you're more upset about the curfew. Azuku glances sideways at Shota. He doesn't look up long ducking his attention back to his lap when Shota glances in his direction. I am, Shota tells him honestly. I mean, you shouldn't have been fighting, period. And certainly not without supervision. That's not the way to resolve things with your peers, especially as a hero, but I know you're both teenagers still. Your emotions and hormones are all over the place, and I get needing to just work off stressors and emotions. That's logical. What I'm really mad about is the fact that you both knew what you did was wrong, and you still did it. You went against the rules that I placed in the dorms to keep you all safe, as well as UA's code of conduct. You're damn lucky that Yagi pleaded your case, problem child. You can't be behaving like that, not with a provisional license. Izuku gives a light nod, mouth twisted in a thoughtful curve. They settle into a comfortable silence. It's late, past the room curfew by a while now, but Shota's not too worried about that, not when he's sitting right here with the kid. Room curfew is more or less just to keep the kids on a schedule. It's not like he's going to punish someone for being unable to sleep, for coming to the kitchen for a late-night snack or something. 
As he grows quiet at his side, it's that thoughtful sort of quiet that the kid usually does before he starts mumbling out facts or plans or whatever other clever tidbits he shares. Kachan blames himself, Azuku pauses, scratching idly at his thigh. That, that's why we were fighting. Shota glances down in surprise, having not expected the boy to say anything more. Azuku still isn't looking at him, hands still ringing anxiously in his lap. Shota's gaze tracks over the spattering of scars on the boy's hands, wrists, and what he can see of his arms below the sleeve. For what? All Might's retirement. The boy finally glances over. His eyes are watery, but he's not crying. Shota's heart still cracks. And I get it. I, I was there, too. I sort of... I get it. He was there saving us. All Might was trying to rescue us, and now he can't use his quirk anymore. If we hadn't... If we hadn't have gotten kidnapped in the first place, he'd probably still be able to. The kid's voice wavers off. Did you ask to get kidnapped? Shota asks easily when the boy's voice dies off. What? The kid's head jerks up, and he's staring wide-eyed at Shota like he lost his mind. No, of course not. I was just trying to get Kachan back. And Bakugo? Shota questions. What about him? Did he phone up Shigaraki and ask him to get targeted by a bunch of villains and taken from a school trip? Did he ask to be kidnapped? No. Isuku wrinkles his nose like he's offended for Bakugo's sake. That sounds ridiculous. It is, Shota agrees. Just as ridiculous as blaming yourself for things that happened to you is. You didn't get a choice in the matter. You didn't decide to get kidnapped. It just happened. That's not your fault. That's not Bakugo's fault. All Might's a grown man and a seasoned pro hero. He did what he was supposed to do. And that was getting the both of you home to us. But if we hadn't been taken in the first place... Izuku. Shota sighs softly, arms snaking down carefully until his arm is across the boy's shoulders. He gives a light squeeze of the kid's shoulder, and the boy promptly pitches into Shota's side. Yagi would have lost his quirk at some point, or another either way. He was hurt in that fight a long time ago, and he still hasn't been the same since. I'm sure you already know that, though. Chronic injuries like that get worse as time goes on. You can't heal from that. It was only a matter of time. At some point or another, he was... Going to need to hang up his costume for good. Everyone does. But it is neither of your faults. Shota tells him sternly, but not unkindly. What happened to All Might was years of hero work and not knowing when to take a break. It was a villain fight that went south years ago that finally caught up to him. It's illogical to blame yourselves for something that was inevitable. He was going to retire at some point. It's not like you forced him to fight that villain. He made the decision that we all would have made— Given the circumstances, he chose to fight and protect. He chose putting a dangerous villain behind bars instead of savoring what was left of his quirk. He knew what he was doing, kid. Shota doesn't say anything else as Izuku presses in closer to his side, nose and forehead settling against the side of Shota's chest. All he can see are ruffled green curls, but he can feel the boy breathing against him. Without a thought, the man lifts his hand to knot through the curls, scratching lightly in the way that always calms Hisashi. Izuku relaxes slightly. I just... His words are muffled in Shota's shirt. I feel bad. I can't tell you how to feel, and what you are feeling is valid. Shota pushes Izuku's bangs back so that he can mostly see vibrant green eyes that are staring up at him. But it's not something you should feel bad about. You were a victim. Bakuga was a victim. You don't blame a victim for what happens to the person trying to help them. What do you mean? Izuku asked softly, his voice still muffled. I mean, you don't blame a fire survivor if a firefighter gets burned pulling them out of the building. You don't blame someone that's getting mugged if the mugger shoots the cop trying to arrest them. Bad things happen, Izuku, and they happen to good people. You're the victim. Shigaraki and all for one of the ones to blame. That makes sense, the teen mumbles. I'd never blame a victim for something out of their control. It always feels different when it's you, Shota tells him quietly but honestly. You will always be your biggest critic, but you've got to remember that you're still a kid. You're a teenager learning to be a hero. You're not a hero yet. Give yourself some leeway. I'll try, Izuku whispers. I think Kachan needs to hear this, too. He will. Shota snorts a laugh as he tightens his hold on the kid. It's so much like a hug, almost. Now that I know what you guys were blowing each other up over, I plan to tell him the same thing, and I hope that Yagi also talks to both of you. 
You'll feel guilty about a lot in this profession, as with any where you hold someone's life in your hands at any given time. Where what you do affects them, but don't blame yourself for things out of your control. He feels the child nod against him, but Izuku doesn't say anything. Are you really not upset that we fought? Shota glances down. I, I mean, I know you're upset about us fighting with no one else around, but you don't mind. I don't. Shota gives a one-shouldered shrug. I don't mind so long as you're doing it safely, in a controlled setting with someone else around. Sparring is a great way to let off some steam and practice while doing it, but you need a mediator. You need someone to cut you off when you push too hard. You're both young, and things get out of control fast. So if we asked, you'd let us spar? Shota wrinkles his nose, offering another shrug. I'm not enthusiastic that Bakugo's the one you chose, but... So long as you two are being safe and respectful of each other, I don't mind you two sparring after hours, with supervision, and definitely before curfew. The boy giggles. You know, Shota, Izuku says softly, and it takes a second for Shota to notice a sleepy lull in his voice. You're a really good teacher, and I'm glad that you're my homeroom teacher. He can't help the smile that slips onto his face. Thanks, problem child. I'm glad that you're my homeroom student. Now it's late. Get up to your dorm room, unless you want to come sleep in the apartment tonight. Tomorrow is your day off, so I'm sure that your friends will want to do something with you. Yeah, the boy yawns, finally pulling back from his guardian, and he rubs at his eyes. Todoroki-kun wanted to work on her math homework together, and he'll probably speculate if I'm not in my room when he knocks. The child pushes himself up on standing, wobbly, and tired legs, and he yawns, rubbing at his eyes before smiling tiredly at Shota. Good night, Shota. Night, kid. Shota's not expecting his phone to be what wakes him from his sleep. There's a light streaming into the room from his half-shut curtain. Neither he nor his Ashi thought to close, so he knows it's morning, or close to it. Still, doesn't make him feel any better as he untangles himself from the blankets. It's more effort slipping away from his Ashi, whose even breaths ghost over the junction of his neck where he's spooning his significant other and has wedged his face. He manages to put enough distance between them to grab his phone rubbing out his tired eyes as he answers the call without checking the caller ID. Eraserhead. He answers the call in lieu of greeting pleasantries. He's glad his Ashi had taken his hearing aids out to sleep, or he'd fear waking his husband up too. He doesn't even know what time his Ashi managed to drag himself to bed at, but he'd definitely be sleeping for a while. His sleep schedule is nowhere near as fucked as Shota's is. Eraser. Tsukuchi's voice comes through, the call of Shota's hero name sounding tired and unsure. Doesn't surprise him that it's the detective on the other end of the line. Nezu, Namuri, Tensei, Hizashi, and Tsukuji are the only ones who really call him, and the first three usually text unless it's an emergency. Shota takes a second to pick the man's tone apart, nervous and almost annoyed, anxious yet composed and calm. Tsukuji, he greets finally, slipping away from Hizashi just enough to sit up and card his fingers through his hair in an attempt to get it out of his face. What's up? Why are you calling so early? I'm not even a part of any of your current cases. You're going to want to be, Tsukuchi offers grimly, and Shota can almost see the grimace in the man's words. His interest is instantly piqued. Oh, yeah? Shota finally sits up the rest of the way, fully, and pulling away from the vice grip that Hizashi had on his waist. And why's that? He swings his legs out from under the covers, and he stands, leaving the room and the cats circle underfoot. He eases the bedroom door shut, even if he knows Hizashi would sleep through an earthquake with his hearing aids out and his late night. I've been in contact with the Los Angeles Police Department recently. Tsukuchi tells him slowly. And they've arrested a person of interest from an arrest warrant we put out. Some favors were pulled by some powerful people. She's here now, Eraser. I need you to come in. You're the first person I contacted. You're the one he trusts. I've already screwed up once. I'm not about to do it again. I'll explain everything when you get here. Wait, wait. Los Angeles? Shota repeats in surprise. Why? What's Los Angeles got to do with me? I've never even been to America. This is more up all night, Sally. Or even his Ashis, even. And who is he that you're talking about? What the hell's going on here, Tsukuchi? Just trust me, Tsukuchi sighs. It's sensitive, and I need you to be a part of this case. I know that you'll have my head, and if you're not a part of it. I've worked with you long enough to know that. This concerns you, and I'll need you to help get to the bottom of it. What the hell are you talking about? Shota huffs out. It's about Midoriya, Aizawa. Shota's entire world freezes. It's about Izuku. What about Izuku? 
He knows better than to ask over the phone if Tsukuji is already being this enigmatic. It's obviously something sensitive, and if it has to do with Izuku, it involves a minor. Fine, he says stiffly, already shuffling toward the bedroom to get dressed. Give me twenty minutes and I'll be there. Awaiting your arrival, Tsukuji replies, and then the line goes blank. All right, everyone, this concludes Chapter 34 of UA Survival Guide. Chapter 35 will be next. I hope you guys are still enjoying this one, and as always, thank you so much for listening.